Okay, I was asked to introduce Ifat, and, uh, and it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce her. Ifat uh, did her undergraduate in physics and finished it with distinction. It was part of the Amirim, the, the parallel to Amirim in Tel Aviv University. Then she did the PhD here in the ICNC, and uh, uh, together with uh, um, Rafi Malach and uh, a postdoc in uh, NYU and started her own lab in Yale. And you will hear all about uh, the topic. I won't extend on it here. I don't want to take time from her. And now we all uh, want to have as much as uh, possible. So I will just tell you uh, one small uh, personal uh, detail. Uh, during the last year of the PhD, we were three students from ICNC that presented in a, a in SFN in San Diego, and another member of the, of the lab finished the talks and went to hike for two, three days uh, in Yosemite Park. And during the hike, we saw an amazing deer and started to chase, her, chase him and to, uh, like a good tourist, to try and make, get a lot of photos. And, and the deer didn't move, and we basically reached like two, three meters from him. It was an amazing uh, experience. And then we realized that the deer is looking in the other direction because there are two bears there, a mom and, uh, and the calf there. And for a second, uh, we weren't sure if he's going to chase us or the deer. Luckily, he chases the deer and not us. And uh, we are here to hear uh, Ifat uh, giving us a talk. So uh, the stage is yours, Ifat. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, how do I hold it? Um, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Okay. Um, so it's really, um, it brings a lot of good memories to be back here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about um, decision making under uncertainty mostly. This is the work that I've been doing in the last few years. Uh, and unlike this guy, I do think that the uncertainty is interesting uh, because it's everywhere, really. If you think about even this small uh, decision, this small choice that you might need to make when you go to dinner afterwards, uh, chocolate cake versus some carrots, uh, it's reasonable to assume that you assign values to the different options and then choose the option of the highest value, which is trivial in this case. But even if in this simple decision, many factors go into it, right? And some are positive and some are negative. Um, and the same factor may be positive for some people or under some circumstances and negative for other people or under different circumstances. And also, some of the consequences of your choice will be certain. For example, the chocolate cake is probably bound to be sweet, but other consequences are less certain. Whether or not you'll gain weight by eating the chocolate cake is not clear. So really, it's a trivial thing to say, but there is only one thing in life that is not uncertain. Um, so what we can take out of this is that, first of all, valuation is a subjective matter, and subjective values are affected by uncertainty. But of course, uh, you can learn from feedback in order to reduce uncertainty. So when you first saw this sign, it may have been completely ambiguous to you, you didn't know what it meant, but then you consumed several McDonald's meals and you realized that the M sign predicts something good, but then maybe you consumed some more McDonald's meals and you realize that it's not so good, and so this means that um, learning, that we need to be able to learn, that subjective values need to be adaptive to the context, to the situation. So this is, um, these are the things that I'm interested in. Uh, my lab looks at attitudes towards uncertainty and also a little bit learning under uncertainty. And we're interested in um, behavior itself uh, and in the brain using mostly functional MRI and also in population differences. Uh, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. The main part will be about decision-making under uncertainty. I'll show some behavioral studies, fMRI study, uh, and then an ongoing study in which we look at the, uh, these processes from adolescence to older adulthood. Uh, then I'll talk, hopefully if we have time, a little bit about value learning, also some functional MRI results and possible implications for obesity. And finally, I'll spend a few minutes talking about future directions. So first of all, the approach that we use for studying decision-making is the neuroeconomics approach, and I just want to spend a few words about what this means, because there's a lot of misconception about what neuroeconomics is. 
Uh, so basically what it means is that we take methods um, and theories from behavioral economics and we use it uh, in our design and analysis. It means that we don't ask subjects what they like or what they prefer. We have them make choices between different options and based on the choices we infer their preferences and so we don't have to rely on um, self-reports. And it means that in the brain we're looking for psychometric neurometric matches, neural activity that matches the behavior that we observe, which is why I think characterizing behavior well is very, very important for these kind of studies. And from behavioral economics, we know that there are different types of uncertainty, and I'll focus on two of them, which um, I'll explain in the following examples. Suppose you had to choose between these two options, $40 for sure, or this thing, which is a lottery. You can think about it as a bag that has 100 red and blue poker chips in it, and you can see that half are red and half are blue. And I'm telling you that if you draw a red chip, you'll get $100. You'll get nothing if you draw a blue chip. So you can think about it as a lottery with a 50-50 chance of winning $100. So these are a certain option and a risky option. And when people have to choose between the two, there is a tendency, or most people go for the sure bet for the $40, although on average, of course, you can make $50 here. And this is what's known as risk, aver risk aversion. Can you repeat the game? Uh, OK, so if, uh, if you repeat the game and you provide feedback after each and every choice, of course, behavior changes. But then that's because the probabilities change. So think about it as just a one-shot game. Yeah. But now, suppose you have the same risky option. But you also have this bag that also contains 100 red and blue poker chips, but you don't know how many are red and how many are blue. So you don't know what the probability for choosing red or blue, for, for picking red or blue is. And I tell you that here, again, you can get $100 for red. Here, if you draw a red chip, you'll get $110. Uh, and this is called an ambiguous lottery because the probabilities are ambiguous or not known. If you had to choose between betting on the risky lottery or the ambiguous lottery, you can think about what you prefer, and most people choose uh, to bet on A. And this is as if they believe that B has less red than blue chips in it, right? As if. I'm not saying that that's actually what they believe, but they behave as if that's what they, they believe, because otherwise it makes no sense to choose an option that pays less and has a lower winning probability. Why would you choose that, right? Makes sense so far? Okay, so far so good. Now suppose you keep the exact same bags with the same chips in them and we just switch the payoff. So now blue is the winning color and again you can get $100 here and $110 here. When people are asked to bet on one of these, and this, this can be the same people that made the previous choice, when they're asked to uh, bet on one of these, again most people go for A. As if they believe that now B has less blue than red chips. Because otherwise again, again makes no sense to choose. Uh, this inferior option. Uh, now, technically, it can't be at the same time, right? The same bag cannot have fewer red chips and fewer blue chips at the same time, which is why this is described as a paradox, and it was first described by Daniel Ellsberg in 1961, and it's been replicated um, several times since. So just to go over the... Um, the, the terms, because from talking to, to different people, I know that we sometimes use the same terms for very different things. Uh, risk is when probabilities of different outcomes are known. So, for example, when you toss a coin, you know that it's 50-50 for heads or tails. Ambiguity is when these probabilities are completely unknown, and you can think about your um, favorite example for what's ambiguous to you. And then in real life, most ca cases are partially ambiguous. Like here, you have some information about the contents of the bed, but not full information. There is an occluder here, and what's behind the occluder could be anything, uh, red or blue or a combination of the two. And you can think, for example, about starting a new experiment. You don't know uh, the likelihood for it to succeed, but you can estimate it as medium or high or something between this and that. Um, so we use these, um, these, these concepts in, in some behavioral experiments, which I'll describe. Um, in typical experiment, what we have is a choice between a certain option, like $5, or some constant option, and a lottery like this. This is, again, an image of a bag that contains red and blue poker chips in it, and the red and blue areas represent the relative numbers of red and blue chips in the bag. And then in some cases, we have this occluder that hides some of the information. What's behind the occluder could be 
all red, all blue, or any combination of red and blue. And the dollar amounts next to the red and blue are the amount of money that you can make if you draw a chip of that color from the bag. Um, so subjects have to choose between this or that option. And we use a parametric design in which we change the amount of money that can be made, the probability for that amount, the ambiguity level, how much information is hidden. We also change this, the winning color. In half the uh, trials, it's blue. In half the colors, the trials, it's red. Uh, and we also have choices between losses. Do you prefer losing five dollars for sure, or losing some, or, or taking some chance of losing more than five dollars? Unfortunately, we're not allowed to actually take money from subjects, so we endow them with a large amount of money at the beginning of the experiment, and then they can lose some of it. We use real bags, so any image that you see on the screen represents a real physical bag with real physical poker chips in it. And so that means that although in principle there could be many distributions of red and blue chips behind the occluder when you see such an image, in fact, the subject knows that this given image always refers to a single bag with a single distribution of red and blue chips in it that we prepared beforehand. Uh, and we also use real money. So at the end of the experiment, we randomly select one trial and play it for real money. So subjects know that their choices actually have consequences for them. And if you do the math, what this design means is that in all of the ambiguous cases, the objective winning probability is 50%. And this is something that I can talk about more later if you'd like, if it's not clear. But this is something that is important to keep in mind for later. Um, they see the real bags. The, in the beginning, they see the real bags. And at the end, when we uh, randomly select one trial, they actually reach to the appropriate bag and draw a chip. They, we play the lottery in a physical manner. Um, no, 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 no. In specifically, this one bag, because in half the trials, blue is the winning color, and in half the trials, red, it doesn't really matter what the actual probability we switch exactly, exactly. So we want them to commit the Ellsberg products, and they do. Um, now we also test rationality uh, in the sense that we have trials in which the, uh, the um, choice should be obvious. Would you rather lose five dollars for sure or take the chance, take a chance of losing five dollars? Of course, you should take a chance, and vice versa if we um, choose between games. Uh, yes. Exactly because of that, because there is a big difference. Because if we paid each and every trial, then in the risk trials, let's say it's easy to think about them, they would be, they would, they will be very little risk, right? If you play a thousand trials or a few hundreds like we have here, and the winning probability is 25%, in 25% of the trials, you'll, you'll win with very small variability. And Right, that, that, that's, that's true. But what we, we want, we actually, I mean, ideally, we would just have you make one choice. But we can do that, especially because we, we can do that because we want to characterize subject behavior as a function of, a function of all the parameters that we change in the experiment. The and be very different. The for many right. the optimal solution is matching probability. For a single one, it's the best. Exactly, it's very different, and that's what uh, that's what we're interested in, in this study. I mean, exactly, ambiguity aversion and risk aversion. This enables us to look at ambiguity aversion in these cases, but we also have the um, trials with no ambiguity, and that an allows us to also estimate risk aversion. I'll show in a minute how we do that. Uh, very good, very good question. I'll, I'll I'll talk about that in a second because that's another thing that we're looking at. You're just uh, knew my, my next um, word consistency in the sense that if we repeat the same choice several times, do they switch? And I'll show results about that. Um, okay, so these are, this is the behavior of one subject uh, in risky trials, so no ambiguity here. Uh, X-axis is the amount offered in each trial, Y-axis is the proportion of trials in which this subject chose the lottery and not the $5. And we start with a winning probability of 75%. So 
So when we offered $5, she never chose the lottery, which makes sense. Yes. So uh, just a quick question. So are subjects aware of notions of expectation, expected value, and so forth? And do they have time to compute probability? They don't have... We don't talk to them about expected value or computer or anything like that, but we did a small pilot in which we actually explicitly explained it to them and and gave them time to make the calculations and it didn't change the behavior. Uh, But no, I mean, we don't expect them to to do the calculations. We want to see how they naturally choose. Um, When we we pay more and more, the subject chose the uh, lottery more and more, so so she was lawful, and we can calculate the indifference point, the point where this subject is indifferent between $5 $5 and a 75% uh, percent chance lottery, which was around $8 in this case. And then when we lowered the winning probability, the subject chose the lottery less and less and less, so she was very reasonable. Um, and then we can do the same thing for ambiguous trials. This is uh, ambiguity um, gains, ambiguous gains. This is the lowest level of ambiguity, and, and in difference point here was around $26. This is a higher level of ambiguity. The subject chose uh, the lottery less. <coughs> okay. <laughs> this is because I'll talk about the fitting process later. We fit everything with a single choice function. So sometimes the fitting is not ideal, uh, but still it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good in the sense of, uh, of R square. Um, and this is one, I'll have I'll, I'll more examples to show you. Um, but, okay, I'll get to the modeling and then I'll, I'll explain more. Um, okay, so at the lowest ambiguity level, you can see that this subject didn't choose the lottery unless we offered, in this case, $125. So now remember that objectively, the winning probability in all of the ambiguous cases is 50%. So if this subject was rational, she should have behaved the same way under all the ambiguity levels, and she didn't. You see that she was, regardless of the modeling, you can see just in the raw data that she was strongly um, affected by ambiguity. Now, uh, before I talk about the modeling, just one sentence. Uh, Really, none of the results that I'm showing you today depends on the specific model that we used. Uh, And we replicated all the results in a a model-free analysis also. But the, the modeling is a nice way to get a compact representation of uh, risk and ambiguity attitudes, and it's nice to use it in the neural analysis, which we'll do later on. Um, so we um, model the choices just using a simple logistic function, as um, the proportion of lottery choices as a function of uh, different or difference in the subjective values of the two options, how much each option was to the individual subject. So of course, if the subjective value of the certain option is much higher than that of the lottery, they should never choose the lottery, and vice versa. If the uh, subjective value of the lottery is much higher of that of, uh, than that of the certain option, they should always go for the lottery, and then there is some uh, stochasticity, of course. Uh, and then the subjective values themselves are modeled using this function. If you're interested in it, this is uh, a simple power utility function. If you can think about that as a subjective probability this is the amount, uh, and what we add here is a term to take care of ambiguity attitudes. Um, so we have two subject-specific parameters. One is the curvature of the utility function, that is a risk attitude uh, parameter, and the other is this beta here, that is the ambiguity attitude parameter. If subjects are not affected by ambiguity, beta is zero, we go back to a simple utility function. If beta is positive, it's, uh, it implies ambiguity aversion. The subject behaves, behaves as if the probability of winning is lower than the actual objective uh, probability, and so on. We can talk about it more afterwards if you're interested, but it's really uh, not crucial, the exact model, and this is used in, used in the uh, logistic function. Just a clarification question. Is P, can go, in the case of, of ambiguity, is P Fifty percent. Exactly. So it will be 0.5 in all in all cases, because it's because the gray is always around this, the center. Uh, it will be always 0.5 in the ambiguous cases. So this is uh, again the same subject that I showed you with uh, these parameters. Just for convenience, I uh, transfer the parameters such that. Seeking is always positive numbers, and aversion is always negative numbers. So this subject was averse to both risk and ambiguity. She was very averse to ambiguity. 
and this is just for illustration, a second subject that had a similar attitude towards risk, but wasn't affected by, um, by ambiguity at all. You can see that this subject really had her um, curves on top of each other. And this is again the first subject making choices under losses. And we know from uh, Kahneman and Tversky and, and other studies that people tend to be risk averse under gains and risk seeking under losses. This is what we see in this subject. She was risk seeking under losses, but interestingly, she was not affected by ambiguity in the loss domain, which is a new result. She was very affected in gains, not affected in loss. And if we look at a population, uh, this is uh, risk attitudes under losses and gains and ambiguity attitudes under losses and gains. Uh, first of all, there was very little or really no correlation between all of these four parameters. And also you can see that there are some trends. So again, most subjects are risk averse under gains, but under losses, uh, some are risk seeking, some are risk averse, but less so than under gains. In any case, this is very different than what uh, comes out of Tversky and Kahneman, we don't see the reflection effect, if it's something that you're familiar with. Um, and again, under ambiguity, risk aversion, uh, ambiguity aversion under gains, but not under losses. So just to summarize this part, uh, there is high variability across individuals in their risk and ambiguity attitudes, uh, and little or no correlation between these parameters, which makes it interesting to look at these four parameter, parameters, risk and ambiguity attitudes under gains and under losses, when you look at different risk-taking behaviors in different populations, and I'll talk about this later in the talk. Um, yes? What, what is the tangency of each uh, estimation compared with the population? The, 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 the expected variance of the estimation of these parameters compared with the variation of the population? Uh, it's, it's pretty high. I can tell you the numbers, but the, it's, it's pretty high, but it's still lower than the variation in the population. Mm. No, 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 no. Um, okay. Uh, so what in the brain? There were several um, studies be before us that compared, that examined decision making under risk and ambiguity and what they essentially did is comparing activation when subjects were making choices under these two conditions. And of course there are differences in the brain because these conditions are very different in many, many ways. But what uh, we're interested in is the effect that risk and ambiguity have on subjective values, on how much something is value, is, is worth to the individual. And if you think about it, risk and ambiguity affect the value of options in very different ways. First of all, you saw in a behavior there is no correlation or very little correlation. So people may be averse to risk and not really averse to ambiguity or vice versa. Also, if you think about it, these are different processes. So at least in the experiment, uh, as we said it in the Ellsberg situation, risk aversion is not irrational. You know, you can have different, ta different, different liking. It's, it's a trade-off between probability and amount according to each individual's taste. But ambiguity aversion is different because you saw that it doesn't make any sense in our setup to be averse to ambiguity. So there is something like, it, it looks like two different processes. And uh, this interested us in the context, in the general co context of the neural representation of value. And I know that there are some disagreements about whether there is neural representation of value, uh, but one of the debates in the, the community was whether there are multiple valuation systems or uh, whether there is a single system. So according to the first view, we'll see a system that represents values of rewards and punishments and cognitive outcomes and emotional outcomes and immediate rewards and delayed rewards and so on. The other option is that at some point along the neural pathway there is convergence and there is a unified valu evaluation system that represents val the value of everything um, and, and under different contexts and different conditions. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what I, I think and, I, and, and what I thought, but many people disagreed. And the idea was that it could be that values are represented in, in separate systems that compete against each other. Uh, but I completely agree with you. Um, so, but in order to prove this, we thought that risk and ambiguity is a good example. Because they're so different from each other and because the behavior is so different, if there are multiple valuation systems, we should expect two value representations under these two conditions. 
but if there is a unified valuation system, it should represent both options, uh, the values of both options. And in order to do, to do that, uh, we should look for voxels in the brain whose activity is correlated with subjective value. And we can do that. We can calculate the subjective value for each individual subject because we have all the parameters of each trial and we have the risk and ambiguity attitudes that we um, calculated based on the behavior. So we can calculate subjective values for, for every trial. We can do that separately for each individual subject and we can do that separately for the risk condition and the ambiguity condition. So this is uh, from a so, so, so we ran a very similar experiment in the scanner, only gains in this case, and we did this kind of analysis. So first we search for areas whose activation is correlated with subjective value on their only under ambiguity. And what we found is this area in the medial prefrontal cortex, in the striatum, posterior cingulate cortex, and the amygdala. Then we did the same thing using subjective value under risk. Uh, and we had to lower the threshold here. Even at that liberal threshold, we found the medial prefrontal cortex and the striatum, but not the posterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala. So at this stage, we thought, okay, maybe these areas do something that is specific to the representation of subjective value under ambiguity. But what we did next is we sampled activation from regions of interest and examined their behavior. We had a lot of data for each subject. Each, each subject went through two scanning sessions, so we used the first scanning session for localization, and then we had, uh, we could do independent analysis on the second um, session, and we started with areas that showed correlation with subjective value under ambiguity, uh, and we saw that these areas, both the MPFC and the striatum, also provide significant information about subjective value under risk, although we defined the areas using ambiguity uh, only. And the same was true when we defined the areas with using subjective value under risk. We, we saw that these areas also provide significant information about subjective value under ambiguity. Of course, the most interesting thing is these areas that seem to be unique for ambiguity, um, and actually they're not. Both the PCC and the amygdala also provided uh, information about subjective value under risk, not just ambiguity. And so, just Oh, just correlation, just correlation between the activity if, if the correlation was significant. Um, with what? So, okay, so I have several <laughs> answers for this. So first of all, hesitation, that is not um, monotonic in value, right? Because you should expect when there is um, small difference in values, there will be <coughs> more hesitation, more difficulty compared to um, higher difference in value. So we should expect a U-shape, not a monotonic shape for uh, hesitation compared to, um, to valuation. But also, uh, I c I, there are <laughs> studies, and I can show we have another study in which we didn't have choice. We just had valuation with no choice, and we still saw the same areas. And I hope I have time. I'll t it's related to my future plan, so I'll try to convert it. That's convincing? Or Okay. Um, okay. So, so, so we didn't have, we didn't see a single brain area whose, activi whose activity was specific to subjective value under one or the other condition. Another interesting thing that we found here is the activity of the amygdala. Uh, amygdala has been implicated in the processing of ambiguity before, and the idea was ambiguity is scary and people prefer to avoid it. So, this is where the amygdala comes into the picture. But actually, that's not what we see. If anything, the amygdala is uh, involved to a similar degree in the processing of both risk and ambiguity, and its activity is positively correlated with amount. So what we think we see here is the role of the amygdala in the processing of value, both positive and negative, as several labs also see, and not its role in, in fear conditioning. So if we go back to the question of neural representation, one versus multiple systems, we think that this pr provides strong support for the existence of a unified valuation system. Now, uh, yes? It's just, okay, it, it's just a matter of power, and I have, I, I can show you slides. I think the problem was that in the risk data set, and we can talk about it later, 
the overall subjective value of everything was lower, and so it just the signal to noise was lower. So detecting activation, we had to reduce the threshold. Detecting activation was was more difficult, and it bothered me a lot. And so um, I ran another experiment with risk only, in which I just boosted the monetary amounts, and then we got all the areas in the maps, and everything was exactly the same. Um, okay, so. There are many studies now that support the same idea of a unified valuation system that represents at least consisting of the MPFC, the medial prefrontal cortex and the striatum, that represents value under many different conditions, value of many things. But all of these studies depend on behavioral tasks. They are functional studies. Uh, and we know that in recent years there is more and more evidence for a correlation between structural um, um, features and uh, cognitive traits or, or preferences. Uh, and so we looked for um, this is in collaboration with Sharon Gilay Dotan, uh, who's an expert on VBM, uh, voxel based morphometry, and we looked for uh, anatomical correlates of risk and ambiguity attitudes. We didn't find anything for ambiguity, but we, didn't find, but we did find this area in posterior parietal cortex whose volume is correlated with risk attitude in the way that the more volume a person had, the less averse to risk they were. And we're very excited about this. Um, this is just an illustration of the results. It's, it's voxel hunting, but it's just to show you that uh, the results are robust. It's not, it doesn't depend on outliers or anything like that. Um, and we are very excited because the posterior parietal cortex has been implicated in decision making and choice processes, uh, mostly in monkeys, but also in some studies in humans. Um, and so um, we like this result, but it was only 28 subjects. Um, and so we looked for a second um, a data set in order to confirm it. And luckily, another friend of mine, uh, Joe Cable from UPenn, had such a data set with a behavioral data, a different but similar risk task, and the anatomical data. This? Yes, so it's, it's, uh, it's um, what was consistent in the, 20th, in the 28 subject. Yes, so it's, it's, sorry, yes. And this is whole brain corrected, so it's a very strict analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did in the second data set, we took the centers of this, the center of this ROI, and then we looked in the second independent data set at the brains of the other subjects, and, and we modeled their risk attitudes as observed in this second task as a function of the volume in the same area uh, with some general parameters, uh, gender, age, and um, global volume. And, you can, and we change the sphere radius, and you can see that around here we get significant predictions using the volume of this area. This goes down when we increase the sphere even more. So it's not a general thing, it's really specific to this area. And also as a control, we looked at another area in the uh, vicinity of the primary motor sensory cortex, and we didn't, we didn't get any significant predictions. So to summarize this part, we see that activity in areas of the MPFC and the striatum represents subjective value under both risk and ambiguity, supporting the notion of a unified valuation system. And also in the posterior parietal cortex, another part of this decision-making uh, network, we see correlation between cortical volume uh, of, of an area there and, and individual risk attitudes. And I think that puts some constraints on what could be the mechanism for representing uh, preferences because uh, if you have more volume and presumably more, uh, I don't want to say that it's necessarily more, more neurons, but more neuronal volume, you have the ability to represent more and you can have le less curvature in your utility function. So it, it all makes sense. No, no, that, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. In, the functional, in this functional study that I presented, we didn't see a correlation that was consistent across all, all subjects. We see it in some subjects and not in others. Other, peoples also, other people also have similar results, and I'm not sure, it's still a, an open question, I'm not sure why. Uh, in monkeys, it's pretty clear, in humans, not really. So yeah, that's one of the interesting questions. To what extent do you the experience of these people's past what do you mean, the experience? I mean, they, they, they have life experience of all sorts of 
Gamblers versus yeah, so, so I, I'll talk a little bit about it in the, in the next study. In that study, it was all students. Uh, we didn't really control for these differences, but they were very similar to each other. In the next study, we're interested in differences, age differences, from adolescents to older adulthood, and there we try to control for all of these things. Um, so um, there are differences in risk-taking behavior across the lifespan. Uh, in adolescents, there is 200% increase in morbidity and mortality compared to childhood, and this is although adolescents are actually stronger and healthier than both children and adults. So this increase is really due to risk-taking behavior, substance abuse and reckless driving and unsafe sex and, and things like that. Um, and it's not that adolescents are stupid. They're actually as smart as adults. They understand the consequences of their actions. They overestimate the probabilities for adverse outcomes and still they engage in these behaviors, and it's not clear why. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, there is mixed evidence about older adults. Some studies show more risk aversion in older adults. Others show less risk aversion or more risk seeking. Um, interestingly, the brain areas that I showed you, uh, prefrontal areas and especially the dopaminergic system, uh, deteriorate the most in a, or, 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 mo or earliest uh, in older adults. Uh, and of course, prefrontal areas develop into uh, adulthood. So um, we thought it would be interesting to look at risk and ambiguity attitudes uh, in different ages. And this is, uh, these are the group of subjects that we had for groups, adolescents, young adults, midlife adults, and older adults. We balanced males and females. Uh, IQ was uh, about the same, no significant difference between groups. We got a lot of information about wealth, um, how much money they make, how many assets they have, and so on and so on. In the case of adolescents, we got information from the parents in order to try and um, control for that as much as possible. All of the analysis that I'll show, we did also by, with controlling for these factors and it didn't change anything. And first we just looked at what could have been if we paid each and every trial. Of course we didn't, we only paid one trial. But if we paid each and every trial and we compare it to what uh, risk and ambiguity neutral subjects would do, of course everybody makes less. But interestingly, there are age differences. Adolescents would make less than young and midlife adults, but older adults would make the least money. And I should stress that these are older adults that are really healthy, healthy cognitively healthy. Um, they have the highest scores on the uh, mini mental, and their IQ is, is the same as the other groups, and um, so on. So first, uh, okay, so just if you think about age differences, it could come from two factors, either decision quality, uh, consistency, or rationality, or attitudes towards risk and ambiguity, or both. So we started by looking at decision quality, these simple trials in which the choice should be obvious. Everybody chooses the lottery. When I ask them $5 for sure versus the lottery, everybody, every now and then, makes a mistake or, mistake, or choose the, the lottery. But all the adults, do so much more than all the other groups. Also, when we look at consistency, we repeated each choice uh, pair four times, and we look how many times people switch. Everybody switches, of course, but older adults switch more. So this is even not even before I'm talking about preferences. The next thing is the preferences. And first of all, I'll just talk about adolescents and, and midlife adults because this, this was the most interesting result for us. Uh, this is a, a model-free analysis, so it's just the proportion of trials in which the subject chose the lottery and not the five dollars. Uh, X axis is adults, Y axis is adolescents, and each point is one probability level. Now, if we think about adolescents being more risk-taking than adults, we expect them, we expected them to be less risk averse. And if they're less risk averse, they should choose the lottery more. So all these points should lie above the diagonal. And as you see, they don't. They lie either on the diagonal or significantly before, below. What may explain uh, adolescents' um, risk-taking behavior may be their behavior under ambiguity. And this is what you see here. Adolescents were significantly less averse to ambiguity or more ambiguity tolerant compared to adults. And if you think about it, I think it makes sense because adolescents are growing organisms that need to sample the world, that need to be open to the unknown in order to learn, whereas adults 
we basically know what we need and we tend to stick to it. Um, we, which suggests that maybe um, adolescents take risks not because they like risks, but because they open to, to the new. And that might have implications for how uh, you can, what would be a good way to change their behavior. But a That's, that's a good, that, that's, a, that's a part of it. I think what might be the case is that um, they need to, they're aware of it, but they didn't really um, experience it in any way. So these are probabilities that they didn't experience. So maybe if you could put them in a safe environment and have them experience the same choices and their outcomes, maybe that will be enough for them. They won't, be, they won't need to be interested in, in, to be open to the unknown anymore because it won't be unknown. And something like that. But it's, um, you're right. It's yeah, it could come from attitude. I mean, uh, uh, if you are worst case scenario guy, you, you don't like ambiguity. Right. Or best case scenario guy, right. you, you look after right. ambiguity. It's right, right. Absolutely. One of the explanations for ambiguity aversion is exactly that that people assume the worst, or at least something relatively bad, and behave accordingly. And it could be that adolescents are more optimistic than adults. <coughs> Uh, so the rest of the groups, these are the four age groups um, in risky gains, risky losses, ambiguous gains, and ambiguous losses. Uh, and again, positive is seeking, negative is um, aversion. And you can see that under gains, all groups are risk averse, uh, adolescents even more than adults, and older adults are more risk averse than young and midlife adults. Interestingly, there was no difference between young and midlife adults in any of the conditions. Conversely, under losses, older adults were actually more risk-seeking than young and midlife adults, which might explain the discrepancy in the literature between whether adoles uh, adults are, older adults are uh, more or less risk-averse. Mm -hmm. Under ambiguity, everybody is averse, um, but uh, adolescents less so than the other age groups. And interestingly, under losses, on average, people are not averse to ambiguity. They're not affected by ambiguity. The only age group that was slightly affected by ambiguity, slightly averse to ambiguity, is the older adults. <coughs> uh, so this is just to go over all the uh, everything that I showed, but basically there are age differences, uh, which are interesting and may explain uh, the behavioral differences uh, that we see in the world between the age groups and uh, could be important for um, policy issues as well, because usually policies and economists take into account the young and midlife adults and, and all the older adults that, have, that might, have, um, might show different behavior. Um, and of course, the next stage is to look at this, uh, this scanner, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, in general, I think the lessons in the older adults are, are poorer than the, uh, just the regular, the two in between groups. So, um, so, we, so we took, we, we got all this information from all our subjects, so how much mon money they make and how many assets, how much asset, how many assets, and so on. Um, they they weren't they weren't poor in the, compared to them to the young adults. Uh, they're actually richer compared to the young adults. But also when we took when we put these things in a regression model to see if it affects the results, it didn't. So it's robust to it. It's a good question. That's one of the problems in this kind of studies. The tons of things that you have to control for. More we actually had one question about this a uh, number of siblings and the the place in the siblings um, I, don't I, I don't know I, it's a good question I don't know <coughs> but the interesting thing is that young adults and midlife adults behave the same from age 21 to age 50 they behaved the, the same on average. Of course, there was a lot of variability, but there was no major difference. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, um, so I don't have much time. Uh, I'll talk briefly about value learning. So in general, so, so what I presented so far was just about attitudes towards risk and ambiguity. There was no feedback intentionally, we mentioned that. Uh, but in real life, of course, you do get feedback and you change your level of, of uncertainty and, and sometimes it, it, it's flexible and it needs to change uh, with context, um, and so in the next project, that's what we're looking at. Um, 
And there are previous studies that examine this question, uh, but in the context of fear learning. Uh, for example, this uh, study by Daniela Schiller. And these studies implicated a region in ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, in this kind of learning. Um, and th specifically, this area is responsive for stimuli that you use to predict danger and don't do so anymore. And the common way to, to interpret it is that it's uh, an inhibitory signal, a safety signal, something that tells the rest of the brain there is no need to, um, uh, to create the, the fear response. Um, but remember that this, is, this area is also within the, uh, what I showed before as the value system. And this is from a meta-analysis from the group of Joel Cable of more than 200 studies showing representation of value in basically the same area. And so it could be that what people see here is just a value uh, response, right? Because a cue that used to predict danger and doesn't do so anymore increased in value. It's now more positive than it, used, than it was before. So this is one of the things that we looked at in the next project. Uh, and here we used a very simple uh, paradigm. It's a reversal paradigm that is based on animal studies. Uh, briefly, there are two neutral stimuli, color A, color B. During acquisition, color A is sometimes followed by a reward image, color B is not. And then there is an unsignaled transition, switching contingencies. Color A is now not followed by a reward, and color B is sometimes followed by a reward. This is work of my graduate student, Ji Ha Zhang, with collaboration, uh, in collaboration with Daniela Schiller. Um, and now if you think about color A, how it switches from predicting a reward to not predicting a reward, now we have two um, different predictions for what a value area and an in inhibition area would do. And let me go back. I didn't mention it. So here, as I said, the result could be an inhibitory signal, but could also be a value signal. And both of these options go in the same direction. That's clear. So we can't really differentiate between them. Okay. Um, and so the, the, the solution is to use a reward learning instead of a punishment learning because then we have different predictions. A value area would show a reduction in activity when moving from acquisition to reversal because the value goes down, right? The stimulus used to predict a reward and doesn't sh do so anymore. Conversely, an inhibitory area will continue to show the same response as before, an increase in activation because it still needs to inhibit a prior, le prior learned response. Um, so this is the experiment. It's uh, partial reinforcement just in order to make the um, learning less trivial. And we used two reward uh, levels, five and ten dollars. The subject's task was to rate how likely they think it is for a reward to appear on a one to nine scale. And they knew in advance that they would receive the accumulated rewards uh, that they see during the experiment. This is the behavior averaged across 18 subjects. This is mean rating in each trial across the experiment, color A and color B. You can see that subjects learn pretty nicely. They differentiate between color A and color B in acquisition, and then they reverse their responses upon reversal. And this is just another way to present it. If you average um, the trials in the early and late phases of the acquisition and reversal stages, you can see a quick significant learning, and then reversal. And then in the brain, first we look for value areas. So areas with activation is correlated with value, and we have two values in this experiment. One is the expected value upon presentation of the cue, and the other is the reward, the receipt of the reward, the magnitude of the reward. So when we look for correlation with expected value or, or the expectancy ratings, we see it um, in the striatum, in the ventral striatum. And then we look for correlation with the reward magnitude, and we see it again in the MPFC, a very similar area to the area I showed you in the risk and ambiguity experiment. Um, but what about the inhibitory signal? We then look directly for areas that are more active for the new CS minus compared to the new CS plus, so areas that are more active for the, sig the, the stimulus that used to predict reward and doesn't do so anymore. And we got a very similar area uh, to what you saw in the Schiller study in VMPFC. And so the conclusion is that what we see here is 
is both value and inhibition. We differentiated these roles in VMPFC. And just to do it in an unbiased way, to localize the area in the VMPFC in, the un in an unbiased way, we uh, contrasted activity during the condition, all the condition stimuli compared to baseline to localize this area and examine its behavior. And you can see that this area shows an opposite pattern to a value area, so higher activation to the stimulus that does not predict a reward. Now, if this area is indeed involved in the learning, we should always also expect some correlation across subjects between inhibitory activation in this area and the learning strength, which is what we plot here. This is the inhibitory activation, and this is the learning strength. During acquisition, there was no correlation, but during reversal, there was a nice a significant correlation. So it does look like this particular area indeed has something to do with inhibition of prior learning. And um, this is what we saw. And, and what it made me think is that this kind of learning might be relevant for things like substance abuse or overeating conditions that may have something wrong with this kind of learning in them, uh, which um, led us to the obesity study, which is the last thing I'll talk about before a few words about future directions. Um, and the support for our hypothesis came from animal studies showing that high-fat diet actually impairs reversal learning in rats, and that in turn, this impaired reversal learning may exacerbate overeating, because the animal fails to learn that the food that used to be rewarding when the animal was hungry is not rewarding anymore when the animal reached satiety. So we wanted to test this hypothesis that maybe individuals, obese individuals show some impairments in reward learning, uh, and we wanted to know whether, if there are impairments, whether they're specific to the food domain. It's a very similar experiment, the same paradigm basically, uh, just behavioral at this stage. Uh, and we had two separate groups. One had money rewards as before, and the other had food rewards, either M&Ms or pretzels, and they had to fast for four hours in order to uh, make their rewards more salient. At the end, at the end. They just saw the image and they knew that they received all these eminent. Yes, yes. The same was true for the money. So it was the same in that sense. Um, and we had um, normal weight and obese individuals based on BMI. This is the learning of the normal weight subject with the food uh, rewards. As you can see, the learning is the same as in the monetary rewards. So this is early and late acquisition, early and late reversal, and there is acquisition and there is reversal. So very normal behavior. We didn't see any of this in the obese group. Uh, no acquisition and no reversal, basically, with food. But in the money domain, normal weight and obese subjects uh, behave very similarly. Now, this is a between group uh, design, of course. Uh, but keep in mind that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the obese group. I mean, I'm sure many obese individuals do not have any uh, learning impairments. And still, we managed to see um, a significant difference, which we quantified here. This is just the difference in ratings between the CS plus and CS minus during acquisition. Normal weight in green, obese in orange. You can see that there is a difference in the food domain, not in the monetary domain. In reversal, of course, you have to take into account the learning that has been done already during acquisition uh, when you calculate the reversal strength. And when you do that, again, there is a difference in the food domain and not the monetary domain. Interestingly, there was a gender effect here, uh, which I think is simply due to the fact that BMI is a better predictor of obesity in women than in men. So we also looked at women only. Women were the majority of our subjects, uh, and the results were the same, just much stronger. Um, so we think that there might be some impairment uh, uh, in reward learning in obesity, which may be specific to the food domain. And what we're um, going to do now is look at the brain and see if this activation that we saw in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is related to this uh, behavioral impairment. And if I have a few minutes, I'll just talk a little bit very briefly about future directions. Um, so as I said, uncertainty is the general direction, and there, these are some things that I'm going to do in the next few years, looking at the possibility or the ability to modify uncertainty attitudes, looking at different sources of uncertainty, different domains, more real-life decisions, population differences, and also looking at this um, uh, transition from value to choice. Um, 
So I'll just say a few words about each. Um, we saw that um, uncertainty attitudes can be very disadvantageous, and the question is how flexible they are. Can we change them by some intervention? Uh, and if we can, what are the neural mechanisms that support it? And this is a study in my lab uh, in collaboration with Ellen Farlong and Laura Santos at Yale that tried to do that. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just say very briefly what Ellen did is she had subjects make decisions, then she had some intervention explaining them exactly what I explained to you, just in a much nicer way, uh, clearer way about the Elspo products and why it doesn't make um, sense to commit it, and actually showing them the Elspo products that they committed and their um, choices. And, and what, uh, so this is um, an intervention in one group, and uh, there were two groups. One actually had to do the math themselves, the other group had the math done for them. And then there was a control group that learned about something else. And then they made, made decisions again. And the bottom line is that only the group that had to do the math themselves actually showed some difference in behavior. The other group didn't uh, show any difference, although they did learn. So it's not that they didn't attend to the explanation. They did provide actually better explanations of what they learned than the active calculation group. Um, here, uh, it's um, uh, scaled from zero to three of the um, how good the explanation was. So Ellen was looking for several concepts in the explanation, and she scored the explanation based on this. Um, okay, and um, we're also looking at different sources of uncertainty. So I talked about something very, very simple and very artificial. This um, uh, physical stimuli that tell you about uncertainty. Of course, it's not what you encounter in real life. And, and also there are different um, situations in which uncertainty comes from, um, ambiguous information comes from trustworthy sources versus unambiguous information from untrustworthy sources and so on and so on. And one of the distinctions that uh, we look at is the distinction between imprecise ambiguity, which is what I showed you today, and this thing which we call conflict, which we call conflict, remember that it's not the conflict that you think about in this troop task or, uh, or decision difficulty. It's just a conflict in the sense that you have two sources of information and they disagree. So what do you do? Uh, we have some data showing that people behave very differently. There is no correlation between ambiguity attitudes and conflict attitudes. Um, and this is what um, Helen Pushkalskaya, my postdoc, is now uh, going to do in the scanner um, to, to look at this these things. Um, we're also interested in non-monetary decisions, for example, medi medical decisions. This is work of Lital Ruderman, uh, my postdoc. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the idea is that monetary decisions not, do not necessarily represent many important decisions that we make in life, and it could be that other circuitry are involved when, for example, it's a life-death decision, or di that just different types of decisions. Um, so people just get this um, description about sustaining a, a TBI and then have to choose between different uh, treatments, um, different in the level of improvement that the treatment can provide and the probability and ambiguity level, everything is similar to before. And um, I don't want to bore you with it, but the, um, we look at young and older adults and see some interesting differences, uh, but also we started to look at a correlation between uh, decisions in the medical domain and the monetary domain, and they look very different. So I think this is something really important um, to look at. Um, population differences, I started talking about the age differences. Uh, I'm also interested in looking at what happens between 50 and 65, which is a gap that we have because of NIH requirements in our grants, but this is something, this is where the change uh, happens and we don't know how and why. Longitudinal studies, of course, will be really, really interesting. And we also look at clinical populations in collaboration with um, clinicians. Um, this is with my husband um, in looking at PTSD. Um, we have some interesting behavioral differences. Uh, PTSD show ambiguity aversion under losses, which other people do not show. Um, and so we have a grant now to look at it in the scanner. Also looking at OCD uh, in collaboration with the um, psychiatrist. Um, and then um, another very general question that um, I have is 
how these value representations are actually used in choice. And um, I don't have time to talk about it, but just um, in response to your previous question about hesitation versus valuation, what we did here in order to really separate value from choice, we just had subjects look at things at the scanner and then make choices between the same things outside of the scanner. So valuation at the scanner was not related to hesitation or decision or preference or anything like that. It was just in response to looking, to passively looking at the things. And, and still we we're able to significantly predict choices that people did outside of the scanner using um, activity from the same areas, the MTFC and the striatum that we localize with an external localize. We weren't able to do it with um, the vicinity activity in the vicinity of V1. Um, so just to summarize everything, value areas, behavior, the effect of behavior on value areas, population differences, um, and I have a lot of people to thank, especially my lab, uh, current and former members. Most of the risk and ambiguity work was done uh, by two Israeli postdocs in the lab, uh, Lital Luderman and uh, Leo Rosenberg Belmacher, uh, and also with um, Agnieszka Timula, an economist. We work a lot with economists uh, on the theory um, stuff. Um, and Jiha Zhang is my graduate student who's working on the reversal. And everything is done in a lot of collaborations. Um, thank you. That's a puzzle. I really don't know. Uh, it's something that I'm really interested in. Uh, there is very little work on ambiguity in the lost domain. Um, and we're now starting to see ambig uh, ambiguity aversion just in special populations. So as I, saw, I showed in the older adults, in the PTSD, uh, in OCD we also see something of this, but not in uh, young and midlife healthy adults. Um, it's, it's just, I, I could speculate, but uh, I don't really have an explanation. That's something that I would love to to investigate more. I'm puzzled by, by the differences uh, in the ambiguity and constant experiments. Okay. If you think about the ambiguity as a large number of constants. Yes, and there is a lot of um, theoretical studies that talk about it exactly that way. That what you do under conflict is you the, the two op the two sources that you have provide you the endpoints of the ambiguity interval, of the ambiguous interval, uh, which could be true, but the fact is that people do not behave that way. They behave very differently. It could be, again, it would be speculation, but it could be, and this is what some people offer, it, um, that um, if you, under conflict, whatever choice you make, you'll be at odds with one of the sources. In ambiguity, no, it's not the case. So it could be that for this reason, it's more aversive uh, for some reason. Thank you.